Well, friends, I'm now 61 years old, and for some of you, that's old, and for some of you, that's young. I still have a few memories in my very early youth of places of business that were closed on Sundays. Um, There we go. Um, Even in not very religious Los Angeles, these were the legacies of a quickly passing culture where Sunday was considered a holy day, and people were expected to use the day for worship and family time and rest. Closing non-essential businesses allowed employees to do that. But they also functioned to limit the options of those who could care less. Some years later, when I moved for a while to western Michigan, where there were a concentration of traditional Dutch Reformed Calvinist Christians, I heard all sorts of stories from my congregation members who grew up in that environment of the rigors of Sunday Sabbath observance. I think the one that, that sort of stuck with me the most was of a young a guy who as a youth always went to, to summer camp uh, at a camp on the shores of Lake Michigan of the Reformed Church in America. It was called the Dutch Reformed Church then. And uh, he told me his experience there as a camper. He said, every Saturday, a new batch of kids would arrive in the late afternoon for a week-long camp. And then on Sunday morning, you got up, you got breakfast, You went off to the camp church service, and after that you went back to the cabin, where you were instructed to stay in your cabin and be thoughtful and quiet for the rest of the day. No other activities other than meals were planned. Now, you can imagine, every year this was a disaster. Even for junior high kids who were used to a Sunday Sabbath at home, sitting quietly with nothing to do with a bunch of other kids on your first full day of camp, was maddening for both the campers and the counselors who were somehow expected to enforce this day of frustration. And you know, you just wonder, what were people thinking? But even to them, this was simply the dutiful response to the command of God in the fourth commandment. And of course, if you believe that God tells you to do something, you do it regardless of the consequences. So we're up to number four today. Let me read the commandment for you. Uh, from Exodus uh, 20. It's actually one of the longest commandments or explanations. And the Lord said through Moses, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant your, or your livestock or, or the sojourner who is with you in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And and essentially, to make this more clear, the word uh, Sabbath in Hebrew simply means ceasing or rest. In fact, you know, for them, that's the name of the day, Sabbath, Sabbat. Now, let me say that if there's any sermon where I can be accused of preaching to the choir, isn't this it? The people who need to hear this the most probably aren't here. But that doesn't mean there aren't a few things that we all need to learn or relearn about this. And I think you're going to be surprised at some of the things that I, that I will say this morning. I know this seems like a slam dunk sermon, right? God says directly to keep the seventh day holy, not to work on it. In fact, you know, in Israel, you know what the punishment was for working on the Sabbath? It was death. I mean, they were serious about this. Um, And and to rest and to worship on it, and now I I spend the rest of the sermon simply making you feel bad for not doing this as well as you should, right? Um, You know, the honest biblical message is more complicated than that. And I want to be honest with you and share the complexities of this with you, even if it makes my job a little bit harder. I think you would probably be stunned to see, even within the Reformed Christian community, how deeply divided their views on this commandment are. Frankly, more so than any other commandment. One end of the spectrum, uh, uh, a very dedicated Christian sees the Sabbath as having been instituted and modeled in creation by God himself, given his commandment at Sinai, reinforced all through the Old Testament, affirmed by the practice of Jesus, extending into the early church as it was, it was adapted to Sunday, not the Jewish Sabbath, which started at 
sundown on Friday and ended at sundown on Saturday. But Sunday, the day of Jesus' resurrection, a day that quickly became called the Lord's Day, as we see it called in Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 10. On the other end are very dedicated, very biblically-centered Reformed Christians who see this commandment as completely transformed by Jesus and the teaching of the New Testament and therefore see the fourth commandment as no longer in force for Christians because it's been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So who's right? Well, I, I think they both are, each in their own way. So let me explain, and I'll get to that in just a bit. But just to warn you, like almost everything I preach on, I'm only going to be able to hit the highlights here in, in my 20 minutes. Let's talk about the commandment and the practice of the Jews. It should be remembered that this commandment was a commandment of grace to the children of Israel. You know, frankly, most people, especially the, the de facto slaves like the Israelites were in Egypt, worked every day. I will say you farmers here probably know exactly what that's like. So God gives them a commandment to spend one day in rest and worship. And for most people in history, this day of mandated rest and family time and reflection is a gift, not a burden. It's something you would look forward to. Now we'll come back to it, but the whole pattern of work, rest, worship, and renewal is honestly something God has woven into the fabric of our lives and our souls. Jews benefited from this greatly. But it's also true that they found ways to both ignore the commandment when it was inconvenient and to expand it to ridiculous legalistic conclusions. By Jesus' day, detailed extensions of the law described in excruciating detail of what you could do or not do on the Sabbath, what was or, or wasn't work. For instance, in Jesus' day, if a wall fell on a man, you could only remove enough stones to see how badly injured he was and provide only as much aid as was needed until the Sabbath was over and you could come back and finish digging him out. It was this kind of nitpicking that winds up drawing Jesus into conflict with the Pharisees over the Sabbath. So let me read you our New Testament scripture this morning, one where we start to see that this commandment is being fulfilled and transformed by Jesus. Mark Chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 23, go through 28. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, look what they're doing. What is not lawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, have you never read that what David did when he was in need and he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest, ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any of the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. By the way, every time I read that scripture, I thought to myself, okay, um, they're, they're, they're walking through somebody else's field and they're picking off kernels of grain. Isn't that kind of stealing? <laughs> even if it's like... Stealing on a pretty small scale. Now, now friends, I've been rereading through Deuteronomy and the laws contained in there. And that's why it's a good reason for Christians, New Testament Christians, to read the Old Testament. Because you read right in Deuteronomy. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand. But you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So you know what? They were not violating a commandment. And, and probably not even violating the, the rules of work on, on the Sabbath. Um, but you know, the story doesn't stop there. Beginning of Mark chapter 3. Again, J Jesus uh, entered the synagogue. This is on a Sunday, of course. And there was a man with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. Isn't that just bizarre to think about? And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or kill? And they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger. You think God never gets angry? And he grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was immediately restored. 
And what do the Pharisees do? Do they give praise to God? No. Verse 6, the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. You see how legalism functionally destroys the grace within the commandment to rest. And how that legalism quickly becomes more important than the true purpose of the Sabbath. That it is for humanity's good. And that it is for God's people to use to do good, both for themselves and for others. Now follow me closely here, because I think that it is clear that like all the commandments, this one finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. What is this commandment for? It's a commandment to rest. And what does Jesus promise? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now if I had the time this morning, we would study through the whole chapter 4 of Hebrews, where this is greatly expanded. And you will find many fine scholars who disagree with me, but I truly see Jesus as a fulfillment of the fourth commandment, as he becomes the one in whom we find our rest, and who we find that true worship and intimacy with God. And all the legalism associated with the commandment is then dissolved. Kevin DeYoung, who actually disagrees with me on this, writes this. He says, this is the principle that we find fulfilled in Christ. Jesus showed us the fullest, deepest meaning of the Sabbath, mainly that we should trust God to be our provider, sustainer, deliverer, and savior. The judicial penalties and the ceremonial legalities of resting on Saturday have been eliminated. But while he equally latches... Uh, Sorry. While we may no longer have to follow the day of rest and worship with rigid rules, I think it's fair to say that the principle is still important for our life and our souls. We need rhythm in our lives. We need rest for our bodies. We need to worship our God. We need food for our souls. And, and frankly, we need an opportunity to show the world that God is really our greatest priority um, and, and, and make that a priority. Dr. Robert Rayburn, incidentally, whose, whose brother was the Rayburn who, who started Young Life, uh, had a great illustration. He, he writes this, I read, let me read you this. Dr. Robert Rayburn once told the story of a man who was approached by a beggar on the street. The man reached into his pocket to see what he had, and he found $7 bills. And feeling sorry for the beggar, he held out $6 bills and says, here you go. Now, not only did the beggar take the $6, but with his other hand, he struck the benefactor across the face and grabbed the seventh dollar too. What do you think of the beggar? Don't you think he was a scoundrel? Then what do you think of a sinner saved by the grace of Christ who insists on taking seven days a week, or even six and a half, for himself? Now I have to say that Rayburn is only half right in his illustration. You see, while the legalism of the fourth commandment is gone, um, the reality is, is what we have now in Christ is greatly expanded. We're not to give Christ one day a week. We're to give him all seven. Uh, what I would like to do is to spend the rest of the time I have with you making a plea for us to consider the wisdom and the value of making God and the rhythm of life God has given us a priority on the day that Christians have since the very early church used as a day of worship and rest and gathering. And that is what we call again the Lord's Day, the day or the day of resurrection. And for us, that's Sunday. And it is true that historically, too many Christians have lapsed into a legalistic observance of Sundays. Uh, I've, I had a friend who moved up to Grand Rapids and discovered that, while well, even though she wasn't expected to observe the Sabbath, she no way was, was allowed by her neighbor's angry stares to mow her lawn on a Sunday. But it's certainly true that, that far many more Christians have moved too far in the other direction. De Young says this as well. He says, I've been a pastor for more than 15 years now, and in those years I fear I've seen regular Christians treat weekly worship less and less seriously. I grew up with my parents' unswerving commitment to morning and evening worship and Sunday school and youth group and Wednesday night. Now that I'm a parent, I see how much effort it took to establish that pattern. I will always be thankful for the ingrained habit of going to church virtually no matter what. Are we teaching our kids that Sunday is the day we go to church? or the day we try to squeeze in church? 
I understand that parents may draw the line in different places, but surely there are a few habits more important to pass on to our children than the rock-solid routine of going to church every Sunday. It will be hard for our children to come to the conclusion that church is important to them if we raise them to think that it was only a third or fourth priority for us. We may say Jesus is Lord, but end up showing that soccer is the real king. Too many see corporate worship as a good thing if the weather is nice but not too nice, if the football game is uninteresting, if the sports practice doesn't interfere, or if we're not too tired. Somehow we've got the idea that gathering of God's people to worship at God's throne and to hear from God's word is something that's fine to do when it fits our schedule. This is not the New Testament ideal. Sunday is the day that the Lord has given you to attend to your soul. And I think he's dead right. So let me finish this morning with five quick reasons. Not the only ones, but five quick reasons we need to honor the grace and the reason behind the fourth commandment. Even if we have been freed from the ceremonial Sabbath of rigid rules by the rest we find in the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing I will tell you is that by practicing a Sabbath, you really put God first. I've said this before, but someone once said to me that you should spell love, T-I-M-E. And it is true that our priorities are revealed by how we spend our time. Bill Gates was, early on in his career, asked why he didn't believe in God. And he had a very, very uh, specific answer. He said, just in terms of allocation of time resources, religion is not very efficient. There's a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning. And you know what? You find lots of Christians who treat life the same way. Sunday is my sleeping day, my project at home day, my sports day, even good things like my family day. We don't think of doing these things instead of worshiping God as a sign that they are more important than God. But you know what, friends? You know, most wars are not won or lost in a single grand battle, but in thousands of smaller skirmishes where ground is won or lost. I am not suggesting that you should never take a Sunday off to do something fun like attending a sporting event or a family gathering or a weekend away or even just occasionally if you really need it just to sleep in. But you got to be careful how often it happens because it's easy to happen too often. It adds up quick. The effect is cumulative. Satan doesn't have to make you disbelieve in God. All he has to do is just make you believe that something is more important than God at the moment. Put the Lord's first on the Lord's day. The second thing is this. By observing the Sabbath, God allows us to rest. Be honest, how many of you get to Monday morning and you're somewhat glad that the maddening pace of the weekend is over and you're now back to a predictable rhythm? I'll bet a lot of you do. I know sometimes I do. And that kind of shows we're doing Sunday wrong. I have to tell you, honestly, my wife has this down. Every Sunday after worship, she takes a long nap. It rejuvenates her for the whole week. We now live in a world where you can be busy, productive, and stimulated 24-7. And if you don't intentionally make time for a Sabbath rest, it will hurt your health, your human relationships, and especially your relationship with God. If you've come to Jesus for the rest he promised and you find you're exhausted, you need to find room for God's Sabbath in your life. Third thing is this. It shows to ourselves and to those around us what is truly important. You know, it's interesting that every time a Chick-fil-A goes into a new community, there's a hue and cry from the people that uh, decry their values. And then as soon as the restaurant opens up, they become swamped. Traffic patterns change. And what I do find interesting is that even in the non-Christian general public, they get a certain respect for being closed on Sunday. Um, the, the founder, Truett Cathy, wrote this in his book. He said, closing our business on Sunday, the Lord's Day, is our way of honoring God and showing our loyalty to him. My brother Ben and I closed our first restaurant the first Sunday we opened in 1946. And my children have committed to close our restaurants on Sunday long after I'm gone. I believe God honors our decision 
and sets before us unexpected opportunities to do greater work for him because of our loyalty. Now, of course, you do hear wails of people who want their chicken on Sunday and are going through withdrawals. But by and large, even non-Christians respect this decision that costs the company literally a billion dollars in lost income a year. Because in a world that is ruled by the almighty dollar, it shows that they value something deeper. What you do on Sunday is a lesson to the world on what you truly value. The fourth reason you need to take your Sabbath seriously is that because it actually supports other Christians. You know, friends, you need regular Sunday worship more than you think you do. But others need it desperately. And your presence with them supports them and strengthens them. You know, the great centered, self-centered sin of our age uh, it's, is that it's all about me. And therefore, worship is all about meeting your perceived needs. And it's not. Jesus asks, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do harm? And if we all think about Sunday is, how does this meet my needs? Then we're worshiping ourselves and not the Lord of the Sabbath. We worship not because it simply meets our needs, but because it allows us to support others. And finally, let me suggest to you, friends, that, that Sabbath gives a rhythm to your life. You know, other world cultures don't have a seven-day week. We have one because that's the rhythm God created us for. Six days of busy, one day of rest and to, re, to rest, renew, and, and, and essentially reboot. I will tell you, friends, you will find without a godly rhythm to life, life becomes a burden. And our relationship with God becomes strained. Our age is obsessed with noise and speed and perpetual activity. And so many long for a greater purpose and approach to life. But you know what? God had that figured out from the beginning. Let me finish with, with a final important note um, about the way we need to take this commandment seriously in our age. Um, because we face a serious challenge from the electronic media that we now have most all of us in our hand. We all need a Sabbath from electronics and social media at times. And my friends, this is desperately true for children and youth that are literally killing themselves for a lack of it. A new study just came out. It was all over the news. I'm sure you heard it. Found that suicides among Americans ages 10 to 24 went up 56% from 2007 to 2017. And it was already high in 2007. And that confirms every other recent study that is found. And everyone who has some insight on these numbers has basically come to the same conclusion that this has been caused by access to social media and the internet. Social life has always been complicated for the young and kids have always had to deal with the pressures of friendship and snarky people at schools and their social gatherings. Home and family has been a place uh, for them to decompress, to escape, to be refueled in a positive, loving environment. It was away from that arrest, a Sabbath, away from those pressures. But what happens when those pressures that kids face, they now face in all their waking hours? A 2014 study found that 80% of teens admitted using their cell phones when they were supposed to be sleeping. Some stayed up all, most of the night when their parents thought they were asleep. Another study showed that higher levels of nighttime mobile phone use reported higher levels of depressed mood, externalizing behavior, and lower self-esteem, all triggers for suicide. I won't try to suggest a simple solution for a complex problem, but the whole biblical principle of rest, worship, and renewal is certainly a piece of the puzzle. Kids need a Sabbath away from um, the media and their cell phones. Uh, they need a more positive rhythm in life. These tragic numbers are going to continue to rise until we find that from the very beginning, God has designed a better way. Let me finish with Kevin DeYoung's summary of this. It says, resting can be hard work. Whether we are talking about one day in seven or depending on Christ every day of our lives. That's why we must strive to enter God's appointed rest we have to depend on God instead of our own planning and hard work. Sabbath rest is about making Jesus Christ the center of who we are. It means ceasing to find approvals in others, 
stopping the foolish quest for our own righteousness, trusting that true health, strength, vitality, and freedom can be found only when we cease from our labors in resting Christ. Friends, keep the Sabbath. And when you do, keep Jesus Christ in the center of it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for giving us this great rhythm of life, for setting us up with uh, an opportunity to rest and, and worship and renew and reboot, to protect us from the madness that our world would put on top of us. And so, Father, we ask you that you would help us to focus on, our, on you, that we would find in you our rest and our worship, our Lord of the Sabbath each and every day of the week, but they would find those special times just between us and you that we might be renewed. For we pray these things in Jesus' name, the one who fulfills all the commandments. Amen. soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, my heart on righteousness, I look to Him who hears me. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah, my delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my My soul in God alone Amid the world's temptations When evil seeks to take a hold I'll cling to my salvation Though riches come and riches go Don't set your heart upon them The fields of hope in I sow our harvested If anything this morning has caused in your heart a need and a desire to strengthen your relationship with Jesus Christ or to find someone to pray with you, we'll have some members of our prayer team up in front of the pulpit here after the service to pray with you. So friends, go from this place in God's rest. May his peace be upon you. And may his peace, his grace, his presence, and his love be with you now and forevermore in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.